Let's cut the crap and get right down to it. Some people are just better looking than other ones. Some wines just taste better than others. And for some reason, some places are just cooler than others. And from the second that I stepped off the plane and into Torino, Italy, I knew right away that it was one of those places. Torino was Italy's first capital back before it was even called Italy. And it has all of the ingredients that for me, you need in the recipe to make a place amazing. Architecture, history, vibe, culture, cuisine. Torino's the kind of place that captures your heart immediately. And I can't wait to check it out. And lucky for me, I have an old friend that lives here, Andrea Caviglia. Was a good trip? Hi, buddy. How are you? On my previous trip to Italy, Andrea guided me on my first big game hunt in Italy. And things went well. Perfect shot. My Italian chamois hunt is over. Now, several years later, I reconnect with Andrea here in Torino at his friend Tommaso's house. Tommaso is an art dealer and a hunter. This is unbelievable. It's like a palace. <laughs> Tommaso's place is a literal time capsule of how the aristocracy lived centuries ago. And as he showed me around, I was afraid to touch anything. And I was also totally blown away. Unbelievable. There's more history in this tiny little spot right here than just about anywhere in the world. This is the center of it all. The first capital of Italy. The history behind Tommaso's place was just the beginning. The guys and I hit the streets, and within just a few blocks, the amount of history is overwhelming. Like the Palatine Gate, that's one of the best preserved Roman gateways in the world. Yeah. All of this is, though, related to the royal court. Everything, so everything. Is this, is this an old castle here? After a quick history lesson in Romans, kings, and castles, our next stop turned my attention to the more religious side of Torino's history. This is one of the most intense places I've ever been. Right behind that altar right there in that chapel behind it is the Shroud of Turin, which is a, a big piece of linen that it's thought is what covered Christ right after the crucifixion when he was in the tomb. One of the most holy relics on the planet. It's right there. Gives me goosebumps. The Holy Shroud of Turin is one of the most prized relics of Christianity and also one of the most hotly debated. It was originally thought to be the linen cloth that Jesus was buried in. But the authenticity of that claim has been the subject of biblical and scientific study and debate for centuries. Regardless of its origins, the simple fact is that the people who come here to be near it well, they want it to be real. Holy relics are an important part of the Catholic faith. And that's something that I learned firsthand from my grandmother. My grandma passed away a year ago at the age of 99. She was a devout Catholic. She loved to travel. And I know she would love that I was lighting her a candle here in this church. Such a special place. Miss you, Grandma. Once I'd had my fill of Torino's history, it was time to fill up on some of the other stuff that Italy is famous for. And then Tommaso took me just a few miles out of town to a place that quickly reminded me just why it was that I'd come back to Italy in the first place. This is unbelievable. <laughs> so this is literally the hunting lodge of the yeah, king. Yeah, the hunting lodge is the king. Yeah. And it's how, how far from Torino? Just, uh, just five, five miles, uh, 10 kilometers uh, from the city. And so he would just hop in a carriage. Yeah, and, and come here a couple to, hours to, later, uh, to have be hunt. in his hunting yeah, lodge. Yeah, yeah, deer hunting here. Right, yeah. which you can see the stag up there yeah, and everything. Yeah. Historically speaking, Italy and hunting go hand in hand especially for its native red deer. In medieval times, it kept people fed. It helped men train for war, and it was considered a social occasion. But when it comes to the social side of things, that was definitely mostly enjoyed by the upper classes of the time, and there is probably no better example of this anywhere than the Palazzina di Caccia di Stupinigi, the hunting palace of the king. It's just a little bit different than my hunting lodge. <laughs> yeah, hunting lodge. <laughs> I have two bedrooms. <laughs> He had like a hundred. <laughs> Unbelievable. But you're not a king. <laughs> I am, this is true. He's got a point. I am not a king. 
Feeling very inspired, we hop on the road and the guys took me to one more spot that they say has an ancient tradition that is guaranteed to bring me good luck for my red stag hunt. To have uh, good luck uh, for hunting, you have to cut the balls of the bulls uh, with the, your feet. You have to yeah. crush the you, bull. You must, you must. The balls yeah. of the yeah, bull. Full. Go for it. Uh, it's all right, it's all right. good luck. Like this? Yeah. <laughs> That's it? Yeah. In fact, I need extra, extra good luck. <laughs> <laughs> you too, come you, on. You could also jump. <laughs> hey, whatever it, whatever it takes, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. The boss of the bulls. Uh. After an incredible day in Torino, Italy that included stomping on the balls of a bull for good luck, we drive two hours south to the Italian Alps and the tiny village of Marmora. I'm immediately struck by the beauty of this place. The trees had their eyeliner and lipstick on, and the mountains looked incredible. Finally, we arrive at my home for the next few days, and it's here that I meet my guide for the rest of the trip, Luca Bugarelli. Luca is one of the most celebrated Italian big game hunters of all time. He has spent his entire life traveling and hunting. He's even written books about it. Now he's the director of operations at the world-class booking agency Montefeltro, who has the exclusive rights to hunt this area and are famous for first-class accommodations. And as Luca shows me around, I realize that Montefeltro has outdone themselves once again, because this place is simply sublime. It's crazy, Luca was just telling me that this house, at least the main part of the house, was built literally in the 11th century. <laughs> when you put it into perspective that the United States is less than 400 years old, <laughs> that's pretty incredible, 11th century. I head up to my room and try to get settled after the long trip. I go to sleep with my head in the clouds dreaming about Roaring Stag, having no idea that the next morning would begin in the clouds, literally. Today I have an entire Italian posse joining me that includes Andrea, another guy named Andrea who's the local gamekeeper here, Tommaso from Torino, my buddy Iris from Franchi, and of course Luca, all here to help search for a giant Italian stag. The plan here is very similar to hunting elk out west like I'm used to. You hike, you glass, and you call. I'm lucky enough to hit the red deer rut right smack dab in the middle. Mm. It's just like elk hunting. It's the exact same thing. They call, you call. That one's pissed off. And I love a good pissed off bull. And they call this rut the roar. And that's because instead of a bugle, the male red deer make a moaning, roaring sound that is very unique. My first day in the Italian Alps chasing these stag was awesome. After the fog rolled out, we saw more and more stags, but it was either the distance between us or the size of the animal that kept me from pulling the trigger, so we kept on walking, glassing, and calling. Towards the end of the day, we spotted this very, let's just say, frisky bull, and oh, how I wished I was on that other ridge. And if there were some magical way to make wishes come true right now, I can promise you I'd be a happy man. Luckily, in came Iris to the rescue. <laughs> Let's go. What do we do with this? Okay, you have to take your wish yes. in your mind, and then close your eyes, and then you have to... <sighs> <laughs> okay, here we go. My wish. <sighs> oh, good job. Do you want to know what my wish is? <laughs> no, it's you, your wish. You don't? But now... <laughs> I'm sure that I will, will, it will be, will, it will be happen. <laughs> it will be, I hope so. My, my wish is for red wine tonight. <laughs> we all know that wishes and prayers are not always answered. And as we came down off the mountain, I came across this farmer out milking his cows. And then I wondered, is that a sign? Am I supposed to be drinking milk instead of red wine? You've heard the saying, curiosity killed the cat. Oh, obviously that cat is just getting fat, but my curiosity definitely got the best of me and I had to try for myself. Let's go. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up with livestock and I was actually pretty good at this back in the day, but all I managed to do here was just get milk all over my jacket. So I stopped wasting this guy's time and let him get back to work. <laughs> the way he can do it. I got like three squirts out, which is the story of my life. 
I leave the farmer alone and we walk about 100 yards to meet the farmer's wife, who makes cheese from that milk. This has been getting done this way in this town, probably by this family for hundreds of years. This is why I love hunting. It's not about killing. It's about adventures like this. I love this. You know, Mary? It's so good. Mm -hmm. mm. It tastes better when you know where it's from. That's yeah. right. Yeah, for some reason it tastes better when I know that I just milked this cow. Yeah. <laughs>